morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Adobe Live. I'm your host, Chris Blackstock, and thank you for joining us. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our new Adobe Live channel on YouTube to stay up to date on the latest streams, participate in the Adobe Live challenges on the community, and so much more. Also, don't miss our Adobe Express streams right before this stream. Tune in and learn how to implement the easy-to-use app into your workflow with Annika Agarwal. Hello, everybody. We are with Caddy Huertas, a wonderfully talented editorial illustrator and designer. Hi, Caddy. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. Um, also, chat moderators. I think Sam is moderating today on uh, Behance. Hey, Sam. Hey, Gareth. Uh, General Kenobi. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Adobe Live. Also, thank you so much for joining us without the chat, without the participation. It's just not as fun. So it's good to see everybody here. Um, also, welcome everybody on YouTube and Behance Live. And if you want to find us on Behance Live, it's b.net slash Adobe Live. And you can come hang out and chat with us. And we also are on YouTube. So yeah, Caddy, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, maybe show us some of your work. And then uh, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Sure. So I'm originally from Colombia and I'm currently living in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have a background in fine arts and I still do a little bit of traditional painting, which is what you can see behind me. And um, through that, I kind of like stumbled into illustration and I've been doing that for a while now. I work with different publications and I've also worked with um, commercial clients like Disney Plus, The New York Times. Uh, I do book covers and today we're going to be doing editorial illustration. So I'm going to start with a sketch and um, you guys are probably going to help me out picking the sketch and we're going to be working on fresco because what I found is that fresco is very similar to traditional painting, which is what I really like about it. Mm -hmm. um, before I had the iPad, I used to illustrate on uh, Photoshop with like a Wacom tablet and that was great but it's not as like easy to use as fresco in my opinion and I, I just feel like painting on the screen is great and so yeah that's what uh, that's where we're gonna be doing I have here more examples of like editorial illustration some of them are animated very subtly so if um, we end up having some extra time we can do a little bit of animation as well Awesome. Yeah, I love your work. Um, I was telling you before, um, just the traditional feel is so great, especially with uh, editorial work. Um, and I love that you took the extra effort and, and kind of have some of that motion and animation. Um, it kind of allows it to be as is an in print, but also living online and on our screens, it kind of gives it that extra something. So beautiful work. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, these are awesome. Well, cool. Well, yeah, whenever you're ready to get started, please. Um... Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to pull up Fresco. And as I told you, I already have some sketches here. Uh, and with editorial illustration, you usually get like a brief and you mm -hmm. tend to send back to the art director a couple of sketches for them to select the one that works best. And sometimes okay. they pick the one that you like the most, but sometimes they don't. So what I have here are a couple of like rejected sketches that I really like and that I mm -hmm. think maybe we can pick one of those to actually make it um, the final. So okay. this one was a very nice article about like uh, a note to paletas, basically like popsicles in Texas. Uh, and this was a rejected sketch. So uh, all my sketches are super rough and loose. So I'm sure the final wouldn't look like this, but this is this is one of them. I have this one about how so many people from California are moving to Texas. And so this was kind of like a play um, with the flag, like the bird from the California flag, like yeah. painting itself on the on the Texas flag. <laughs> um, this was was a little bit more like open ended, but it's more about um, how winter is coming. And I feel like I did this sketch a couple of years back 
but around the same time of year and i feel like now again like when summer is coming to an end which is really sad mm -hmm. for me <laughs> i do love the uh, i like fall but winter is too cold for me especially here in dc so oh, yeah. this was one about like having to be like super bundled up like with many many layers including hats um so i have a couple of different ones and i'm gonna go through them and I don't know. I think I have a preference uh, towards the one that I'm going to pick. But okay. uh, if anyone in the chat has a preference or if you think there's one that could be like valuable to work on, I'm happy to switch and like start on that one. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we can uh, definitely ask ask chat um, if you want to go ahead and um, give us the options and maybe we'll have a name for each one so that chat can chime in. That'd be okay. great. So this one is option one. Um, it's about like Hispanic Heritage Month. And it's like how there are so many terms that uh, people like to call themselves or not call themselves like Latinx, Latina, Latino, like Hispanic. It's always kind of like um, a fight within the community, I guess. And right, so right. Um, we're also coming up on that time of year since it's middle of September to middle of October. So mm -hmm. this is option one. Option two was like, uh, it was for a scientific article on rewiring the brain, like the childhood brain when you're a teenager, that you can still do it. Um, so option three, it was a book review about uh, kind of like different stories from different people, um, all connected in like a single story. And so each door represents like a person's um, like journey. And then option four, the one, the ones that I already talked about, option five mm -hmm. is the Californian bear and then option um one two three four five six is <laughs> the popsicle one yes so what's your what's your preference curious which um, one you're yeah so i am in between um this the first one which is this one uh mm -hmm. just because i like the idea of the stickers i was imagining like a window with stickers and then someone like looking at it from behind uh, mm -hmm. with like the different words written out and then i also like this one um which i think yeah. is kind of silly it's very specific but yeah yeah i love i love that one. i both of your choices i think are are pretty strong so let's see they'll, it'll they're, they're coming and let's see three or five i think this is option five correct one two three four so. five yes that's yeah. five okay all right. Uh, Kathleen says, I vote Caddy's choice. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. Nice. Um, uh, Sam, Sam, our moderator says he kind of likes four. So I think, I think we're going to leave it, uh, leave it up to you. I think I want you to have the most fun today that you possibly could. So, well, I think whatever one you're most invested in, I think we should go with. Yeah. I also actually really like this one. It feels like a little bit kind of like less heavy content wise but also lighthearted especially because now we're gonna have to start dressing like this again at least in yeah. this part of the country and i think mm -hmm. it, the composition kind of like works well both um horizontally and vertically so that mm -hmm. could be nice if i want to like post it so i'm thinking i'm thinking i'm gonna go with this one okay let's do it all right so I had all the sketches from before, so I'm just going to delete all of them, all the other ones. And I always keep the ones that are rejected safe, just in case a moment like this comes. Or if I am right. short of ideas, I can kind of like repurpose them. Yeah, it's like you don't always have a, a it's hard keeping a digital sketchbook, right? So you kind of have to save those files. I, I try not to delete anything, which is <laughs> why I think my computer is so slow sometimes. Yeah, me too. I have to like I use Apple products and so I had to buy like all the iCloud storage I keep apping it and apping it until like yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do so yeah. this is a JPEG I'm setting it to multiply because I'm gonna start drawing below it so I but I still want like the dark lines to show and I'm gonna lower the opacity a little bit um, and will we be working in fresco today completely or are we gonna go anywhere else or so we're going to start in fresco. I think the majority of the illustration is going to be done in fresco, but then okay. once we're done with it, uh, either today or tomorrow, we're going to move on to Photoshop just to kind of like 
adjust colors, add textures, um, and that kind of stuff. I always feel like things look different on my computer for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. And I do like how you can like work at bigger sizes. So I think I always like to finish everything in Photoshop regardless. Right, right. Yeah. And I'm, of course, I'm working in separate layers because I don't want to have to... Um, I don't know. It has happened before where I have like not paid attention and drawn everything on the same layer, and then it's a it's terrible <laughs> it's to it try is. to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> what oh, I think yeah. in those cases is like, okay, that's how it works in traditional painting. So it is what it right. is. Right. But <laughs> right, you got to commit now. You've got to everything's everything's real. At least you still have the uh, undo button. Yeah, that's perfect. But if you're too far gone. At that point, you might yep. just take your lo loss and keep going with it. Yep, um, exactly. So I'm going to first kind of like try to figure out a color palette for me to work on. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw my work, but like I kind of like always use similar colors. I think those are the ones that I like to work with. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not like a specific hex code or anything. It's just like the vibe of like maybe a primary color that's super bright, um, like this yellow. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make that I'm gonna use for highlights. And I'm just gonna keep this in a separate layer so I can pull from it. Um, that might be too harsh. It looks like PowerPoint um, blue. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I can definitely see the palette. I mean, there, <laughs> there is some uh, alterations. I mean, that the Washington Post Magazine one is kind of a good example of taking some of that palette and kind of veering away just enough to kind of create that beautiful red green um but yeah, yeah no, I, re I really like your color choices oh thank you and like sometimes the content needs something different like i do love these colors but if it's like like a plant uh and it needs to be somewhat realistic i'm gonna have to like right. like see a little bit but i think that's where highlights and shadows help because mm -hmm regardless of what I'm painting, all my shadows tend to be blue and my highlights tend to be yellow, so. Right, right. It kind of, it, it still gives that style and feel of your work. Yeah, and I'm gonna show you this later, but uh, something that I uh, do to unify all the pieces once I'm done is that I go with kind of like a paintbrush over everything, just like adding mm -hmm. little touches of paint. That way mm -hmm. I think it also looks a bit more um, analog. Yeah, I like love that. canvas, like traditional canvas. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I had a uh, an oil teacher, uh, oil painting teacher, and that was his style. Was and he would always kind of talk about this, like he's you know constantly bouncing around the painting, like where do I need, where does my next color need to live, um, where do I, how how do I need to balance the light, or how can I harmonize these things. And so a lot of it too is taking those colors, those primary colors you're using, and then with your highlights or accent colors, and it's like, where can you kind of put them in the composition to kind of bring your eye around and kind of put it all together, you know, kind of sneak in some of those other colors that you might not expect. Yeah, for sure. And like, that's part of it too, because I feel like if you have just like a little bit of one color on one side and not anywhere else, it's either going to call attention to it, which might be your intention. So it's great if that is. But if you want to keep it like more cohesive, then I think it's better to kind of like keep it spread out. Right. And um, I don't know how familiar people are with Fresco, uh, what the level of familiarity. So if I should be like kind of like explaining everything that I'm doing. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that would be great. I, you know, the explain as much as you can while working without it distracting yourself too much. We, we still want to see the work, obviously. But yeah, I mean, it's I think it's always good to kind of let people know why you're choosing things, what tools you're using, um, and also any any uh, shortcuts or things that you use that make the work faster, I think is always great. Perfect. Well, uh, one thing that I saves a lot of time is that I have a collection of favorite brushes because mm -hmm. uh, Fresco comes with tons of brushes and I also has have like all the like special pack brushes, like Hal Webster brushes. So I have so many that it's like impossible to go through them, especially if you're working on a deadline, like with editorial illustration, that's one of the things that it's kind of like super tight. Uh, right. Like sometimes you have to deliver something in like a day or two. So um, 
I know that I like some types of brushes more than others. So if I like a brush, I just put it in my favorites list with this little start. So here I know I have some of the ones that I'm going to be using the most. And I always tend to keep like one that's very painterly and then one that's more like inking just to fill in the shapes, which is what I'm going to start doing now. I'm actually going to put a base. Oh, this is another great shortcut. Like instead of having to select your color or your color picker, if you just press and hold and you move mm -hmm. it around, um, the color picker is going to pop up and then you can pick whatever color. That's why I have all my color swatches here on my illustration. Uh, I could also like put them here or in a library, but I think right. this is what works better for me because I just have them there visually. Yeah, it's like having a palette in front of yeah. you or something. Yeah, basically. Basically, I'm just trying to replicate what I do um, with my paints, but like digitally. Right, um, right. Yeah, but it's way faster. For example, I just filled this whole background with a shade of color that it would have taken me so long to do otherwise. Yeah. And the other great thing that I use a lot is a uh, clipping mask, which I'm going to be showing mm -hmm. in a little bit. Um, that way you don't have to worry as much about like um, going outside the lines. Yeah, I, I use a lot of clipping masks um, in my work as well. Just uh, makes makes it a lot easier down the line. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm still trying to decide what colors, what's the outfit going to be like. And the mm -hmm. good thing is that once I once I move into Photoshop, I may change the colors completely. So but it's good to start with like a good base. And then like if things change, that's fine, too. But at least something that that looks good to start with. Um, oh yeah, so what I just did is I created an outline with like an inking brush and then I just filled it. So I'm going to do it here again. Mm -hmm. Basically blocking, blocking out your colors. So it makes yeah. it a little bit easier if you have to change them or before you kind of get into For texture. Sure. And... Uh, and I'm blocking them with the paint bucket. And so just tapping and clicking and... This is really cool because I don't know if you noticed when I first did that, I kind of like had like a white outline in between my outline and mm -hmm. whatever the paint bucket filled. And so with this, you kind of like can control how much. So like here you can see it, like you right. see the division. But if you yes. um, if you play with this, it can go away. Sam, I need you. Do they have that in Photoshop? Because they need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is an amazing tool. I did not know that that was there. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, it's I, great. I run into that <laughs> issue all the time, and it's like you got to select it and kind of grow it yourself by the pixels to make it not do that. Yeah, that's I'm, what I I'm used curious. to do before, or just paint mm -hmm. it manually, like filling the the white yeah, parts right. manually. <laughs> right, but it just seems like you're like, come on, paint fill. You know, what, you know what I'm trying to do here. Just fill out those extra pixels. Oh, and this is another great shortcut. Um, so I'm erasing with the same brush that I'm painting, um, mm -hmm. which is that inky one. But instead of having to go back to like the erase tool here on the left and like select it, um, if I tap on this little button here, uh, this little mm -hmm. gray one and hold, uh, it's going to start erasing with the same brush that I'm painting. So it works with every brush. Like basically if I'm, us I'm using like the painterly one, Let's say this one, if I hold here, it's going to erase with the same one. Very cool. Yeah. So you can, you can keep the same texture. You're not going to be like erasing with like a super harsh one or having right. to look for your brush in the eraser section. Yeah. Photoshop has a, the similar thing with the, the hotkey, the tilde key that allows you to do that. Um, so, and you're right. It's really important so that you can keep the texture and the, your edges, that texture of your edge, whatever brush you're using. Um, because otherwise, right, it kind of looks like you're just cutting it out with an eraser instead of kind of going back in or looks like you m meant to draw it like that. You know, you don't want to lose your texture. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So that's basically what I'm going to do first. What I always do with my illustration is just filling in the colors. Uh, mm -hmm. And once I have those shapes using the clipping mask, I'm going to like paint it with the more painterly uh, brushes. Okay. But um, 
this might take a little bit just while I have it all uh, yeah all completely. set up um uh let's see Evie has a question for you um is it a preference to block out the colors with pixel or vector uh I block everything with pixels I I know fresco has like great vector tools and that's great if you're working um i don't know if you're printing really large or if you have like a more flat style for me because anyway i'm gonna use those painterly brushes like i could do this mm -hmm. part with vector but then i'm that's not gonna be like my final illustration so i might I, i'm just using um pixels because all the other brushes that i'm gonna use the painterly ones are also pixel wise and right. yeah so and having that many textures also on on vector that kills my computer i tried it and it's horrible <laughs> okay <laughs> because it's like so many tiny shapes like little like each little like right. brain is little like anchor points yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> and like i tried anyway to work large and i know usually working with editorial you know the sizes that you need to deliver stuff and if it's going to be printed large and small and i try mm -hmm. to uh paint larger usually just in case Yeah, I mean, it's, it'd probably be rare that um, they would ask for something and then be like, oh, yeah, actually, we're going to, after you already delivered it, we're going to put it on a giant billboard. <laughs> you know, it's like, you'll usually know about that ahead of time or yeah. have that in your contract for sure. And like, if that happens, they probably will have to pay more. So I might as well just redo it or something. But I don't know. Yeah, I feel yeah, like... <laughs> exactly. Um vector i think like even if i was gonna print something super large i might try to do it with pixel just like a huge canvas for like each little part and then like join mm -hmm. it oh i didn't close that one properly and um yeah it uh painted everywhere let's see yes have to close in the shapes that happens a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. look i have that thing again the little white yep. uh there you go. That is such a cool feature. Yeah. I that is like something that I always <laughs> deal with and, I'm, and it drives me crazy. I'm just like, I gotta go back and um, Sam is right. There's something you can do where you can select, modify and expand your selection when you do fill ins like that with the lasso tool. But it is a, just a few extra steps that you kind of wish it was something like this with the easy slider. Yeah. I feel like that's why I say like sometimes this is super easy to use. It's kind of like intuitive, um, but I'm sure Photoshop has. Yeah, what you said, Photoshop has it. It's just like Photoshop does so many like cool things and so many things that it's really hard to get to know it like completely. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and I just filled it again. And I the, what I'm doing to go back really quickly is just tapping with two fingers and that's the undo um, command. You can mm -hmm. also do it here with the little arrows that are at the top, those two. Okay. Um, but just tapping is, I guess, faster. Do you ever run into any issues um, having the touch controls on or the gestures? Is there, do you have any specific settings or is it usually just on the default for the, um, the iPad? I keep it on default. I know sometimes when I'm zooming in, in and out, like pinching the screen, I may mm -hmm. accidentally like draw a line um, mm -hmm. and I'll just erase it. I feel like mm -hmm. <laughs> that has worked for me. There may be settings, but I haven't looked into them. Right, it hasn't been much of an issue to yeah. have to change, right? Yeah, Sam, Sam is saying that with all the advancements in AI lately, we need AI that can autofill flat colors more intelligently. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, they know. Yeah, it would, they know that you intend to fill the entire shape, not just like one pixel. Yeah, if I could <laughs> just this. have this feathered pixel <laughs> outline, that'd be great. Maybe um, they'll fix it for you. Yeah, let's just we just gotta make a stink about it. It'll it'll get <laughs> fixed. But yeah, I mean from what I've seen with Adobe Fresco, it's it seems like a really great illustration tool. I mean like you said, especially for editorial and um 
I've just seen a lot of great um, paintings, like environment paintings. It seems like a lot of the textures and brushes that they provide. Um, and also, like you were saying, the, uh, the ease of use. Um, it just seems like a very intuitive program. Yeah, and you can import brushes from Photoshop too. So if, if what you like about painting in Photoshop is the textures, you can have that here as well. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, yeah, I think maybe text would be one thing. I mean, it does have like a text capability, but if you're working designing vector logos or something, then maybe like Illustrator or something like that might be better. But I feel like other than that, like Fresco is like a great alternative for like drawing and illustrating. How long have you been using it? Uh, I don't know how long, a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. But what's cool too is that it's very much integrated into Photoshop because mm -hmm. I started, I've been using Photoshop for like, I don't know, decades, I think. Like, I don't know how much. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like an easy transition. If you know Photoshop, it's somewhat similar. Uh, and they're very much integrated. So learning one from the other is kind of like very easy. Yeah, I think that's my homework this week is to do some do some character designs in Fresco. That's I, I, I can't believe I haven't done it. I've been so busy with other things. I haven't really jumped into it, but I, I've seen enough now that I think I'm really excited to start using it. Yeah, and that way you can draw like when you're on the go, like you can take your iPad wherever rather than having to take like a laptop and a tablet with you. Exactly. Uh, do you use a tablet when you're painting? Yeah, so I have a, uh, a Cintiq that I use um, and I love it. I just I got one of the the 24 inch, the Pro. So that's been a huge, huge upgrade and uh, lots of fun. And I have a, a nice movable arm so i can kind of get into any position to to draw on that um and then for portable i have an ipad uh that i use um but yeah i've used uh clip studio and procreate um and i've used photoshop a little bit on there but like you said i the photoshop isn't um it's not like a full photoshop on there so it kind of I'm almost confused sometimes with some of the things. I'm like, why can't I do this? So I'm actually really interested in, in Fresco. I think uh, I'm definitely going to hop on it. Um, maybe that'll be my next stream, be doing Fresco. Yeah, Before. and like Photoshop is more, I think Photoshop on the iPad is more like for photo editing, in my opinion, yeah. like, rather than drawing. Fresco feels yeah, exactly. like the drawing app, yeah. That's that's kind of what I've been learning. So I, I think it's I think it's time. It's time that I, I jump into this. Yeah. And with your iPad, do you have some type of like screen protector or do you draw on I the do. glass? I do. No, I ended up getting, I think it's a Japanese brand. Um, it's a paper like texture. Um, oh, so it's yeah. like a, a matte kind of, it's like, it's not rough, you know, but it just, it's got a little more tooth to it. So you're not clanking on glass. Um, if I can remember the name, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, but yeah, so that's, I've, I got a few of those that I use, um, but I, I find it, uh, really helpful. Um, I didn't really like <laughs> drawing on the iPad. No, the it's screen yeah, that they have. It just felt like someone was clacking nails on it or something. And it's also like, yeah, your pencil like slips. It kind of like, it's not smooth. I hate it. And also you get like yeah. more of a glare. I also have like yeah. a paper one, uh, but I've tried different ones. I, I want to. I'm curious to see the one, the, the one that you use. Yeah, I have to look at my purchase history. If I can't, I can't remember. I bought it a while, I think over a year ago, so I can't really remember the brand. But it's worked great so far. I haven't had any problems, and it reads fine. And you know, so. That's pretty cool. Uh, what I'm doing here is that I realized I was drawing on the same color palette uh, layer. Uh, yep. See, <laughs> so, here we go. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I'm just going to turn that off for now and then keep drawing here. Um, <laughs> there we go. I'm glad I realized uh, earlier. It would have, it would have, I would still would be able to save it, but it's just like better to learn that now. <laughs> yes. Oh, I still have some pink here, probably. Oh, and one good thing about Fresco that it's different, let's say, from Procreate, is that you don't have a layer limit. 
That is awesome. Yeah. I mean, the more layers you, you use, it's going to get really slow, but still, right. you don't have it. Yeah. Right. It, it depends on what type of iPad you have and how much you know memory you have and all that stuff. But um, that is that was a huge, and it is a huge thing with Procreate is, yeah, if you really, you, it's hard to go big because all of a sudden you hit these layer limits and you're like, hmm, <laughs> how can I, this is not going to work out. Because I usually, I'll, whatever I do on the iPad, it almost always ends up in Photoshop on my desktop. I, I have a hard time finishing or uh, not a hard time finishing, but I'm almost nervous sometimes having the finished product be purely on the iPad. Like I kind of want to see it on my desktop first on my monitor and like make sure everything's okay. Yeah, I feel like that's what I do. I finished like the entire drawing here, but I need to see it before, like before I send it in Photoshop and make sure the colors look right. Right, um, right. Because colors also look very different on every screen. Like I've noticed that when I work here on my iPad, everything looks very bright. I guess it's the iPad screen, like it's different. And then yeah. you send it to like your the desktop and it looks kind of like a bit duller, like. Yeah, it, and it's tough. I mean, it's just, I have the same thing with uh, the Cintiq is trying to get those colors to match up. You just, I definitely have to bring it onto my desktop and then do some adjustment layers just to make sure everything's reading the way that I've been painting it because there's nothing more frustrating than <laughs> choosing all these beautiful colors and then you see it on your desktop you're like that's that's those aren't my colors yeah no there are some adjustments layer layers here like you can adjust brightness and, and things like that mm -hmm. but I still I feel like I still use Photoshop um yeah like just that. the <laughs> yeah the the depth and complexity and just kind of the how many options you have is that that is what's great with Photoshop I would totally wear this um, if I could make it. <laughs> you just gotta, you gotta buy a bunch, cut <laughs> them all up, sew them together, do some quilting. Yeah, I used to knit a lot and I used to have like an Etsy store. And so this hat is actually one of my old designs. Just okay. The one that's on top. Yeah. Right, right. I'm assuming, yeah, I'm assuming there's like, there's four underneath, right? Yeah. Three, like, it's, they're all stacked up. Um, pixel. See, I keep, um, actually, because I had it this selected and I touched the screen, it filled it in with the blue. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I, I've noticed there's been a few things that, um, I noticed that if I have my iPad uh, charging, um, it can actually create uh, glitches while I'm working. Um, so it was funny because it took me a long time to figure out uh, with using some of these programs. I'm like, why is it creating these awkward straight lines or the it's not reading the tilt of my brush properly? Um, and so I found it, I finally found it online in a thread and it was in a forum, you know, and everybody's like, oh, for some reason on some iPads, if you're actively charging it, um, it can kind of create these like little glitches on some of these painting programs so if you're having that problem people maybe check that because i know that helped me a lot because i was losing my mind i was like what <laughs> is happening that's super weird i mean i haven't noticed yeah. that but i am charging the ipad right now so <laughs> yeah I, it's i've only you know it's not something that happens all the time either and it's it was one of those things where it's like i just i couldn't find a solution and I was like, am I using it too long? Am I, is my hand getting too sweaty? Is my screen dirty? Is, you know, I'd be there, I'm like adjusting all the Apple Pencil adjustments. And so that was finally kind of what I figured out happened. Do you uh, draw with like one of those gloves that only have like some fingers and stuff or no? Yes, I am, I'm a very uh, sweaty human being and my hands sweat a lot. So I have to wear um, a drawing glove. So, but even it all sweat through that. So that's why sometimes <laughs> I'm gonna check and clean. Um, but yeah, for me, otherwise I'd be going, you know, it wouldn't be very smooth lines. Yeah, I've never worn one, but I wonder if it makes a difference. Yeah, I, I can only say that it just makes it easier for me just to smoothly glide um, my hand across the screen. But 
I mean, if you haven't had problems, you probably don't need it. Yeah, but they they look kind of cool too. So you look more professional. Yeah, well, cool. If you're yeah, cool factor. <laughs> yeah. if you're um, wearing them, I wonder: do Get people um, in the chat use those type of gloves, or is it yeah. not necessary? Let us know, chat. Um, does everyone use a drawing glove? Do you have any other type of thing that you might wear um, when you're working on a tablet or a screen? I know I used to, when I was young, before it was digital, because I'd sweat so much just with drawing, I would smear the pencil. And so I used to take uh, tissue paper and poke holes in it with my fingers. <laughs> I used to <laughs> have, that was my drawing glove, was a, you know, a tissue that was wrapped over my hand. So the original glove, this, yeah. Yeah, this is much better. <laughs> this works much better. That's funny. I do have this thing for the iPad, which I think is really cool. Like a little stand oh, that you can like cool. tilt it. Um, yes. Because it's not, then I do have one of those cases that you can stand it on too, but that only gives you one angle and yeah. that's not enough. Right. I do. I also, I have one, um, it has three different settings. So you can kind of have it either really flat or kind of, I think it goes all the way up to 45 degrees. Um, but yeah, they're, I, because I use my iPad a lot on a desk, um, like when I'm at home and I, I don't have access to my desktop. So it is nice. It's nice to kind of have, um, something that's a little more, uh, supportive so you don't have to hold it or they don't really have the one, the cover it comes with isn't very good. If you want to kind of use that to draw on. Uh, one thing that I'm noticing is that, as I mentioned, this is a very old sketch, like a couple of years. And I feel mm -hmm. like the way that I've drawn, that I draw figures now is a little bit different. So I think I'm going to rework that. All right. Um, going to improve a sketch. Let's do it. It's good to recognize, though. And I think it's a very important lesson is if your sketch or your foundation that you're working off of, if it's bugging you, if it's, if something doesn't look right, change it now. Do not wait until you're hours and hours into your painting because it will not stop bothering you. I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it's a structural, like that's the worst. Yes. You can have like a beautiful, it has happened to me where I have like people like figures that I draw like clothes on and I like how, the clothes drape and the fabric looks, but the arm is all like wonky and right. like, what yeah, can you do? Yeah. The one hand, it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh. it's beautiful painting with a little wonky hand. So I'm just gonna try to do kind of like a little skeleton of this person before. So it seems like a few, a few people uh, use some gloves, some drawing gloves. I really do think it's something with perspiration. I would assume most people wear it because it if your hand sweats at all it just makes it so much easier yeah gareth says uh sometimes forgets to take it off and wears it out i've de definitely <laughs> definitely done that a few times walking about and people are giving me strange looks i'm like oh it's because i have my drawing glove on it's also funny because it's not a common glove like i feel like it's the opposite like if you're playing pool it's the other it's the yeah, other it's two like, fingers, so it's like one. Yeah, <laughs> it looks more like something happened to your hand and you're like wearing some kind of brace or something. Uh, when you draw figures, do you usually use reference or do you already have kind of like the anatomy nailed in your head? Um, it just depends. I think there's, you know, I, I would say, you know, I. I'm getting close to finishing um, a large graphic novel. And I, even though I know anatomy pretty well, I would say I still really like to have some type of reference. Um, just because I guess it depends on what, how close that drawing needs to be to, uh, to you know, realism. Um, if it's fun or fanciful, a lot of my character design stuff, um, a lot of that is done without reference usually with like the poses i try to do as much as i can without first to kind of just get gesture and feeling but yeah i guess if i'm really usually if i'm drawing uh women um 
or sometimes even like small kids stuff that I don't draw as often as I do, you know, just, uh, just males or, you know, more, I don't know, things that I would do with comics or fantasy. It's like, you kind of do it enough, but it's like, okay, I need to really nail these soft details or I really need to get the proportions right on this child. So it doesn't look like a small adult. (laughs) (laughs) So, but I would say with most things, I try to have some type of reference um, just nearby or just to kind of get, get the creative juices flowing. Yeah, I think I do the same with when it's portraits and it has to have like a likeness, of course, how it right. references is key. And then uh, for poses too, like if it's a weird pose that, yeah, you don't know kind right. of like how the body is like. But yeah, you're like, I did not know it did that. <laughs> <laughs> if it's straightforward though, I'm just going to use the little like robot, you know, like what they teach you in drawing school that is like the this kind of oh, thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's how I block out all my drawings. Yeah. You've got your little, little circle of a head and you're kind of doing your, you know, okay. Eyes are halfway through and kind of get, find your middle line and, and then you're going to cut into thirds for the nose and the mouth. Yeah. Kind of do all these little balls and spheres and cylinders and cubes and rectangles and kind of start building everything. Okay, I'm going to put this face instead. Yeah. Yeah, I think reference is an interesting thing. Um, Sam was mentioning that um, that he needs to use reference more because you kind of, there is that feeling of like, you just kind of want to draw, you just want to paint, you just want to kind of wing it, you just, you know, want to get into it. And sometimes reference can feel stifling, or it almost doesn't put a box around it. But I I can see sometimes that it feels like it slows the process down. But there's a good balance, I think. um, Because reference can be really important and really crucial. And make your your artwork uh, that much better yeah definitely definitely got to find the balance yeah it has happened too when i'm drawing animals like for Mm -hmm. that bear sketch i had to look up a bear i don't know them by memory yeah exactly if you don't have the muscle memory if if you don't draw it that often yeah i mean unless you're like you said unless it's supposed to be weird and wonky and that's kind of the point go get reference yeah <laughs> as soon as i mean like <laughs> this is very wonky like the proportions is, for this one i didn't right. need like a like a body thing but sometimes i also take pictures of like myself or my husband like when i'm drawing hands and the hand is like the main thing i'll just take mm. a picture of my hand and try to oh, yeah. use that oh i do that all the time i mean i've i've never shot so much reference before um because I this comic I started a couple of years ago with this writer and I had no idea I was getting into a 200 page plus graphic novel <laughs> and it has been one of the most difficult things I've ever done and just the amount of reference you need because I was like wow I thought I was this great illustrator <laughs> <laughs> and composing you know six you know anywhere from I guess you know like four to eight panels per page and Every, all these different camera angles and you just you're trying to capture the same likeness of this character and all these different you know views and it's really I, it's incredible to see how some people do it without a lot of reference I mean they're obviously just masters but otherwise I'm yeah I'm sitting there in my room or like you said I have my wife be like okay I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm gonna lay on the ground okay look at the picture this is where the camera needs to go don't worry about what I'm doing. It's going to look weird now, but it's going to make sense later. <laughs> yeah. It's also funny because when you use those type of references and then the final thing is completely different, you just needed the pose. That has happened. Like I ask a yeah. picture of my husband, like I, I ask him to pose. I take the picture and then I draw something completely different. That's not him <laughs> at all. Just needed the arm kind of. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Hilarious. I always like the, uh, 
I'm with friends or at a family gathering. I'm trying to show them pictures of my kids. And then I've got like 15 reference photos up, pop up. And they're like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, you know, I was tackling an alien and had to like figure out how I would fall. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, doing a graphic novel, that sounds super intimidating, especially, yeah, having to keep the likeness in every panel that's, like making clear that it's the same person that sounds scary. that has been the most <laughs> difficult part i think and also just thinking you're you're kind of designing space for an action sequence you're like okay like this room has to have these things in it or you know what's what's what are these people going to interact with or where are the boundaries uh, are there different platforms of elevation that they're going to be on and you know, so it's kind of funny. I found myself sometimes like, oh, I just want to get this panel done and I'll draw, draw it out. And then, you know, maybe they come back to the scene later in the script and I didn't realize <laughs> it. And I was like, that doesn't work at all. I didn't have to rework it. So it's, yeah, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of work, a lot of fun, but a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache. That's for sure. Yeah. And I feel like you could get too into like a scene, make it super complex. And then if you have to draw it again, it's going to be like, dang, I wish it was simpler. <laughs> yes. You definitely have to think about that. That's especially with yeah designing almost anything that you're going to be using uh, a lot. It's kind of similar with, I, I try to think about it as well with animation. It's like, okay, you know, this, this character is going to be used however many times and especially with 2D, you know, if they're going to be, yeah. someone's going to have to draw this or build build these models over and over again. So when is um, that graphic novel coming out? Um, I am on the last four pages. So <laughs> hopefully soon. I have a feeling with colors and editing and uh, the lettering's all done. But are you just, doing the lettering too or a lettering artist? No, we have we have a lettering artist um, who's been doing it for a long time. Uh, so we're mar- while the companies Marvel and DC and stuff. And then we have a, a colorist as well who's worked with Dark Horse. I think he's, work, he's doing, working on a Netflix project right now, I believe. Um, but yeah, so we've got two people who've been in the industry a long time, which is great because I'm a newbie. So it was nice to kind of have two veterans to speed up the process because um, it's been a, it's been a slow one for me just as a uh, a secondary project a lot of the times and are you the only illustrator in it or are there more people yeah oh, no wow. it's just me yeah and so and i'm working off of a, a tv script so oh that's pretty awesome uh, yeah, it's really fun because I feel like a you know it's like I'm a director, a cinematographer, you know, all these things. Um, but it also takes it's a lot takes it a lot longer to uh, kind of get because I've got to break everything down into thumbnails first uh, before I even get going with anything else. And so that that whole process can take a while. And I think it's about a it was ended up being about a seventy six page script. So oh wow, how long yeah, have I, you been I'm, working on it? Oh, geez. I think I started actively working on it in 2018. So Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, been a it's, it's been a while. It's taken a while. And lot you're down to the last four pages? That's amazing. Yeah, finally. Yeah. Everybody's very happy, especially my wife. <laughs> I <laughs> like, bet. Are you done with that? <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, once you see it um, out there in the wild, it's going to be so cool. Yeah, I'm going to be doing um, some cover art for it. Um, actually, I'm going to be doing a, a stream here on Adobe Live, um, I think in the uh, next two weeks. So, For the cover come, art of that? Come on back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so, pretty That'll cool. be fun. And I'll be able to talk about the book more. But So when you um, changed that illustration or the, the face structure, did you just do that on a separate layer and then yeah. kind of erase the one behind it? Okay. That's what I did. I have it here. So technically I have two sketches, um, the okay. one that doesn't have the face and then mm-hmm. the new face. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's yeah. that much of an improvement anyway, because the face is going to be super tiny, but I think it was blurring me. And sometimes people don't notice stuff that you do, but 
if it makes you happy. <laughs> yeah, you're you, yeah, you're going to be staring at it for the rest of your life. <laughs> so yeah, there's nothing worse than kind of looking at something, a piece of art and being like, I should have, I should have just changed that one part. Uh, Kathleen is asking, uh, it's a bit of an off topic question, but uh, does your spouse support your creative work? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we met very young and when we met, he wanted to be kind of like a film director and I always knew I wanted to be an artist. Um, mm -hmm. but so like we never had a plan of how that was going to work. Uh, but he was always very supportive. And I think like when you do things that you really love, like not thinking, because like when we were that young, we were not thinking about money or anything like that. Just like whatever one, like we wanted to do to be happy. I think like right. things kind of like work out, like things have worked out um, and my work has been able also to like sustain me, which is great. Like I wasn't expecting, I didn't know even that illustration was a career until like an art director reached out. So the first time that I, someone reached out, I was like, oh my God, we can make money off of this. So <laughs> <laughs> No, there's something special um, when you start getting paid for your art. Um, yeah, that kind of first those first few times uh, are pretty exciting because it, it's it is very dreamy and romantic um, and something that when you're young uh, and you don't have as many responsibilities or as much rent yeah. to pay. Um, it's it's fun to think about all the things that you can do. And then, you know, when reality starts to come around and you know um things maybe aren't don't work out exactly how you had planned with your creative career or you know um it is it is pretty nice when you you finally start landing those gigs um, yeah for sure and yeah, yeah I, I remember my first commission when i got it it was by a, for a publication that i really liked it's defunct now but it was lenny letter um mm -hmm. it was like lena dunham's newsletter and i was like a huge oh, okay. fan and I was a huge fan of her because of girls at that time. Um, and I, when they reached out and they wanted to pay me, I was like, oh my God, I would do this for free. Like I was thinking to myself, like definitely not thinking that now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to do yes, anything yes. for free. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that was like, wow, like my first reaction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you, when you get a chance to work with somebody that you really respect or admire, it is, it is easy to kind of go to that place of like, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter. But yes, always try your hardest to get paid for your work. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, for sure. We, yeah. Creatives get underpaid enough. So the more work you do for free, uh, it, it definitely affects all of us. So respect definitely. your work. Ask for what you're worth. Uh, sometimes you might not get it, but it's going to hopefully pay off in the long run. And I think you can always also negotiate, which is like sometimes when clients reach out to you, they have like a set budget and sometimes the budget is big if it's like a big company and you could be like oh my god that's more than what i would have asked but like you can always ask for more even worst mm -hmm. case scenarios that they're gonna say no like oh yeah. no this is the best we can do and like you can decide if you take it or not but it can never hurt and like it has worked most of the times they have wiggle room in their budget you can get a bit more just by asking yeah i mean it is it's an interesting process because I have I have had a lot of experiences of clients not wanting to work with me because they didn't like my price and there was no go negotiation period, which it doesn't make sense, right? And I obviously for I think for bigger uh, uh, bigger companies uh, negotiation is just expected. Um, so I would say if you're ever working with anybody who's well established, expect to negotiate and ask for more if anything because they'll probably want to pay you less for the, for the most part um and so it's always good to kind of make sure you're asking for you know you don't ever want to like resent or regret your asking price because you don't want to end up on a project and then start to feel like you're not being respected or you made a really bad decision on on the price point that you set for yourself so Definitely. and if they don't and if they don't want to pay you what you think you deserve then you probably don't want to work with that client and i know that can be tough sometimes because sometimes you just need the money but you don't you don't want to get into a cycle of kind of devaluing yourself 
Yeah. And there are resources out there for people who don't know how to, much to charge. There's that book. Is it like the Graphic Guild's Artist Handbook or something like that? Yes. I think that's actually um, pretty close to what it's called. Yeah. And they release <laughs> so that. The do name they, is really Do they release long. it every year? I think it's every few no, years. No. Every, every like it? a couple of years. But the new edition came out, I think, last year, which is great okay. because like you can get like a recent one. And there's also... I think it's Rate Lightbox or something like that online. It's a it's a site where people submit what they've been paid anonymously. So you can look any publication, anything, and it could tell you like, oh, great company paid me or like, oh, they didn't pay me or the art director was like a pain. So like, uh -huh. it's a great way because like sometimes illustration can be like very isolating too. And like you don't know what you're getting into with a client. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like a good way uh, of sharing resources and knowing like like taking care of each other because again it's kind of like an industry that people can take advantage of and it's and it's i think it's really hard too because it is it can be really subjective in a lot of ways of what your price point is like there's never a kind of a clear answer um at which i think i've it took a long time to realize like oh it really just all depends on a bunch of different factors you know and like how long you've been working for, what's the quality of your art, you know, how much time do you put in, um, how much money does your client actually have, you know, <laughs> like sometimes yeah. you might have to ask for less just because you want to work with the client and they just don't have a big budget, but the work itself is, could be really great for your portfolio or could get you an even better job down the line. So there's a lot of questions that you have to ask and there's never really a right answer but just make sure you're always taking your best foot forward. And like you said, I think with networking, having other artists, friends or people, even if they're not your friends and they're just somebody that you follow online, you'd be amazed at how many professionals and artists out there that are kind of willing to just take a little bit of time out of their day to answer those questions. Because I guarantee you, all of us have gone through that same process and we know how, <laughs> how horrible it could be and how nerve wracking um, because a lot of times you're representing yourself, uh, which can be really hard. And uh, you know, you're, you're talking to somebody where it's like, that's a manager of a manager or an agent. And like, this is literally their job to negotiate these prices. And for the most part, you're a painter or an artist or a sculptor or a photographer, and you're probably spending the least amount of time, you know, studying business and, and all these things. But, so make sure you reach out to somebody um, and make sure you do a little bit of work on your own to kind of learn a little bit more about the business, of, especially with editorials, usually freelance. I mean, there are obviously uh, in-house uh, illustrators, uh, a lot of these companies, but um, a lot of this stuff is also uh, freelance. Same with character design and other things. It's, it's good to kind of know how to protect yourself and have as much information on on your end so that um, it's not so scary yeah and one thing is that um like with commercial illustration which is a bit different when you work with brands you can also negotiate like usage and mm, if someone is definitely. buying like your whole like the rights for your piece they should be paying you way more than if they're just right the licensing buying, fees are yeah. very different yes even if it's the same, if, even if it took you the same amount of time to draw, like if they want to use it on a different uh, place or a different way, the price is different. Yeah, it's that was something that I don't think I really realized for a while. And I, I remember uh, an artist, I used to work at a fine art gallery and an artist um, that I was assisting at the time, uh, I was kind of talking to him about it. I was doing a contract for a bigger client and he was just like, well, what's your, you know, like, what's your licensing fees? And it's like, how long are they going to have access to it? You know, is it global for two years or what? I'm just like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, you should be charging that. He's like, that's, that's how a lot of people make good money. And it, it allows the company the flexibility to use your work where they want to. And it makes sure that you're protected financially. Um, so yeah, it is, all that stuff's really important. And like you said, I think Sam put it in the chat. Uh, graphic artists guild handbook pricing and ethical guidelines it's just a good base to have um, because obviously it's not none of it's a perfect um, it's not a perfect system but it's good to kind of have uh, notes on like okay doing this for this type of client and this industry should look somewhere 
around here. Yeah. And sometimes the range, uh, the ranges that they give are like very fast. It's like from 2000 to like 20,000 and you're <laughs> like, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> but it's still. Like, well, yeah. And I think it's even more interesting now, um, just with like the international landscape, you know, with the internet and how many, you know, especially with freelance, it's like, well, I could be competing with a job, you know, for a character design with somebody here in Los Angeles, but they could also be over in Europe or, you know, in South America or somewhere else. And so it also varies too. And like what their pricing is going to be with that client as well. So it is, it is a, a very interesting landscape now um, just because we can produce the art from anywhere, which is awesome. Yeah, I think as long as companies don't take advantage of that, they should pay everyone the same regardless of where, of where they're yeah. based. I know there's another, I'm forgetting all the names, but there's kind of like a collective on Twitter also for, I think, South American uh, artists for mm -hmm. to also kind of like keep track of like prices and things like that. Because again, if sometimes clients don't give you a budget, but they ask you like, oh, how much are you charging? And like... Mm -hmm with the change rates that they're so different, you may think you're asking for a lot when in reality it's like not enough. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so I'm starting to do the texture now. Um, and what I'm using is the lasso tool to kind of like block in the shapes that are not blocked because like for the orange parts and the blue parts, I can use my clipping masks, but because mm -hmm. my, uh, my uh, base is kind of like the background color. Um, I'm just kind of like selecting so I don't go over it. And anyway, it's below everything, so it's not going to affect the layers on top. But I'm still like kind of like blocking it out with the lasso tool and just painting inside it. What uh, what brush are you using right now for those textures? Um, that one is a soft, soft acrylic. OK. And are all these brushes, uh... Do, are they currently just with fresco are these special packs that you downloaded or um these three like canvas brush old bristles and soft acrylic they come with the app and then okay. the other ones are uh kyle's brushes which you can gotcha. download for photoshop and then import here too right he has so many though it's hard to pick so <laughs> going through yeah. all of them takes a while <laughs> to know what the yeah. one that you like But I really like this soft brush because it's kind of like not super harsh. If you want to leave like hard edges, you can, but still like it has some texture to it. Like mm -hmm. you can see it's not like super flat. Yeah, no, I, re I really like that. It kind of adds to the coziness of the material. Yeah. It feels fluffy. And so because of all of my shadows tend to be blue, even if the background was pink, I feel like it starts grabbing more of that like blue tint, blue highlight, mm -hmm. which I think goes in theme with like winter. Mm -hmm. um, and in the final art, is the sketch going to be completely gone? Does any of that show through or? No, it's going to be completely gone because all those okay. lines I'm going to delete and then okay. all the colors are going to be the ones that create the shapes. There's going to be some lines in the face, like maybe this will stay, but I'll add more stuff to it. Right. Well, we are about, let's see, gosh, we are an hour in. I cannot believe this. Already? Like time has been flying by. Yes. So if you are just now joining us, we are here with Katy Huertas, who is a wonderfully talented editorial illustrator. You can see her work in all types of publications. I think doing stuff for Disney Plus, the Washington Post, many other clients. Please check out her website if you haven't already. Um, this is just day one. I believe this is going to be a two day illustration, right? We're working on the same thing tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to finish it up, like finish adding textures and then move on to Photoshop. And hopefully we have extra time, maybe animate something subtly. Maybe it's blinking or the little like strands move. We'll see how much time we have. Well, awesome. 
Yeah, so if you're joining us on YouTube, hello, welcome. If you're here on Behance, welcome. If you want to come over to Behance Live, it's b.net slash Adobe Live. We've got the chat going. If you have any questions, please ask them. Sam, our wonderful moderator, will hopefully get to it. I will also be looking for them. But if you have any questions for Caddy about what she's doing or any questions about Fresco, we would love to answer them. So we've got about an hour left. So hopefully we'll get somewhere, a nice stopping point. But everything's looking great so far. I do love the color selection. Thank you. I think color is so important. And I do love, like, I think my palette comes mainly from like actual paint. And then like, I'm trying to adapt it for, for um, digital because I used to work mostly with like primary colors to mix everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I don't even know what would you call that kind of orange red that you're using. It's, I don't even know what the. It's a beautiful color. It's, it really goes really well with that that dark blue. Thank you. Yeah, that's color theory, right? Like complementary <laughs> colors. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. They're beautifully complementary colors. Yeah, orange and blue. Yeah, my, uh, my wife's a jewelry designer and um, one of her most popular colors is very close to that, that orange. It's like, she calls it poppy, um, but it really is just like very rich and just kind of pops out at you. Oh, that's really nice to you to have like a spouse that also does like creative work like that. Yeah, it's, she was a, a teacher for a while, but she um, she had always loved uh, graphic design and she had, she had done visuals for uh, free people at the stores. And so she had always had a creative, a creative mind. And uh, yeah, I think <laughs> the pandemic hit, she, she uh, was pregnant and it just, well, weird, like, I guess it's time to start a company. <laughs> One of the weirdest times to do it, but she did it and it's been awesome. And I'm yeah, super proud of her because she's uh, an incredible artist and she makes really, uh, really great jewelry. So that's pretty cool. I cannot imagine like being pregnant during the pandemic must have been like terrifying at the beginning, I guess. Well, she wasn't. So we had our son two months before the pandemic, like officially started. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So she was like pregnant and she had started it while she was pregnant, the business. And then the pandemic hit and then we had our, our second child and we're like this is going to be interesting <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out that's great yeah yeah it feels no, like it's it's no go ahead no i was gonna say like the beginning of the pandemic it feels like so terrifying everything was crazy with everything closing down and like everyone washing groceries i remember i would watch like all my apples, like everything it was. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. And the whole time thinking, I'm like, is it worse that I might be like poisoning myself accidentally <laughs> with all these like cleaning Florox. materials? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, it was a, it was an interesting time. Definitely do not want to repeat it in any way, shape or form. <laughs> Okay, so now that sketch layer has been turned off, so we can kind of start to see it now. Yeah, I feel like I might turn it on eventually just to make sure lines are okay and stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah, it won't have that harsh um, like outline. I can get like really lost in detail. I can probably spend here so long. So. If I'm taking too long, maybe I can advance a little bit for tomorrow so we can have it in like a better place. It's just like I draw yeah. loving like fabric and, and hair and that takes so mm -hmm. long, but it's just kind of oh, like therapeutic I mean, too. Yeah, and that's, please, I mean, that's that's what I do usually between, between days, the two day stream is I kind of do a lot of busy work in between just so that it's a little more enjoyable to watch 
the second day. But you know, this is this is a part of the process. It's always good to kind of see what goes into it. So, you know, don't don't skip any steps. You know, we want to see how you work. Um, and please feel free to do whatever you need to do between now and tomorrow. It's definitely not an issue because that you can also just show us what you did, you know, in the beginning of the stream tomorrow and just catch everybody up. It's it's it'll be easy. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Evie said she dropped the it's vermilion, which I think is very close to the color that you are using. So it's good to know that name. I looked it up and it's very close color, color wise. Oh, nice. Is it, I'm, in my head, vermilion is more red, right? Like more, yeah. less orange. Yeah, I think it, it's like a little bit more red, but it's, it's a close, it's close. It's yeah. a good starting point. Maybe it doesn't have a name. I don't know. And it could, it's always hard too, right? Because people have different computer screens. And oh, yeah, see. for sure. <laughs> you never, yeah, you're never really knowing how someone else is seeing the color. I'm imagining this kind of being like a little reflective, so I'm going to add some highlights that are... Okay. Is all the patchwork, is it all the same material or is it alternating materials? I'm thinking it can alternate. I'm imagining okay. maybe like the orange one could be like that, those puffer jackets that are kind of yeah. like shiny. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to add the highlights like that. Um, oh, and I'm using clipping mask, which is what I was going to show you before. But you see how this goes off. Um, if you clip it with this little thing, everything that you draw on top of that layer is going to be constrained to that shape which is really great because you don't have to worry about like having to stay in the line just to make right. it and where's right. the where's the clipping mask option uh, just uh to... it's here on the do you see okay this there it one. is yep yeah okay i'm still deciding um because i also when i do when i draw clothes i like to add like little stitches like basically mm -hmm. everything that takes a long like a lot of time I like to do like All hair, the little details, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might not be visible but I don't know I like it yeah it's nice I mean those things are nice I think they get noticed in the long run or maybe subconsciously picked up and people they don't realize that they're enjoying those details yeah I'm gonna add this lighter yellow here too Yeah, Evie says that uh, clipping mask confused me. I You're can... not the only one. I think starting out, it is, it's a little strange. You're like, how does this work? Um, it's great. But... I'll show you again. Um, yeah, once you, you get it, it's, it's a pretty simple process. So I'm just going to unclip it, which you can unclip it just by clicking the same little button here. Mm -hmm. um, but like, let's say I'm drawing this, right? Like I'm, I have like this crazy line. Uh, if I clip it, it's just going to be constrained to that shape behind it. So it's not going to go here on top, which is great for what I'm doing, that I'm kind of like painting with a big brush, that it's definitely going to go over. I mean, you could do it manually too, like try to not go out of the shape. It's going to take you so much longer. So mm -hmm. if you don't clip it, it's going to just like be everywhere. So it's like a great thing. And I know like all every software has that like i know illustrator has it and photoshop has it too yeah. um they're all like a little different illustrator the illustrator one always confuses me because it's like opposite to like what you do in photoshop i think you don't put the thing on top but you put it below or something like that right the order's different yeah yeah sam sam's got a great it's just you're creating a shape and when you put a clipping mask on top of it you're just whatever you put on that layer it stays in that shape it yeah. just doesn't go outside the shape. That's that's a clearer way to put it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's still it's still recording all of the strokes you're making. So if you take it away, you'll see everything that you've drawn outside of the shape all crazy. But if you want to be constrained inside the shape, you just put a mask on it. Clipping mask. But yeah, I think mostly 
it's great for doing texture and like you said big strokes so um, if you want to add that texture to a specific shape it'd be really hard to do it manually and kind of have those cool that that stroking energy and and maybe you want to do a big big brush and it'd be really hard to kind of keep that brush within the shape and it also so you don't have to go back and erase along the shape to try to get a perfect yeah like here for example i'm trying to do some type of like rim lighting and if i mm -hmm. unclip my mask it's gonna wait i think it's this one no it's not that one i have so many things yeah so it's gonna go outside <laughs> yeah, there you go right um and i mean i don't think you can name layers here but anyway i don't do it in photoshop i know it's like good practice it just takes so long do you name <laughs> your layers oh yeah i have to because <laughs> it gets so complicated i if I didn't, it'd, be, it'd just turn into a mess. But that's when I'm doing it. I usually do it if um, I'm doing like big paintings. And sometimes I'm like, okay, I've got, you know, 30 different pieces that have their own clipping mask and shadow highlight. So it just kind of depends. On, on quick stuff and drawings, I think I usually just do a pretty limited naming. But I usually do, yeah. But I know a lot of people who don't because it just kind of, it either gets in the way of their process or slows them down. Like I know for animation, if I'm working in After Effects, I am definitely naming them because that's yeah, so you have confusing. To, yeah. yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna yeah, you're gonna be very sad <laughs> down the line. <laughs> but for Photoshop, I just add a ton of layers. So at the end of the day, it would be like highlight one, highlight two. Like so, it's I just don't do it. Mm-hmm. Sam Peterson is putting up some examples for clipping masks so everyone can try to understand a little bit better because sometimes it is hard to talk about. It. It's easier to visualize. But um, learning clipping masks is going to help you a lot in the long run um, if you do a lot of texture work and detailed work. So this is what I was saying. I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning or not, but like adding. So I'm going to basically do this to the whole illustration and it's just mm -hmm. adding textures. And then once I have like a base of like shadows and lights, I like to go back in and add like actual paint brushes, paint, paint strokes that are they're a little bit more loose. They're not constrained. And I think it gives it more like an analog feel also yeah, because it has yeah. that texture behind it, like that canvas texture. Yeah, is that the is that canvas texture from the brush or is there a okay it is the canvas yeah, brush, gotcha. It's it's from the brush. It's pretty cool. Like very cool. And because it's pressure sensitive, like if you do it very light, you're just gonna get I like, mean it's great. Light. Yeah. I mean, like you said, if if um if you did any type of painting, oil painting, acrylics, it, it's the one thing that can be kinda tough with digital is finding those really uh, beautiful brush strokes that you would get on a canvas or that you can do, you know, there's something where it's have a brush in your hand loaded with a specific amount of paint and the way that you, you apply it to the canvas and trying to replicate that uh, digitally can be difficult sometimes. Yeah. And I still like to paint traditionally just to keep practice and mm -hmm. I feel like they both inform each other, like things that I do on canvas translate to here and same things that I do here translate there. Right. Like there's kind of like a clipping mask for painting, which is like a masking fluid. Yes. So that's kind of like this, the analog version of that. Yeah. Use that a lot with watercolor uh, painting. Definitely. And gouache. There's also a uh, frisket, which is another one. Sometimes when I do so much blue on things, they kind of like starts looking a little bit muddy. And that's what mm -hmm. I fix in Photoshop because I kind of like I can target like the saturation of only the blues and things like that. So I think that that helps too. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, like we were saying earlier, just having, bringing in a little bit of that color, it just tends to kind of harmonize the painting, the piece. Because a lot of the times I think people can get trapped in using one color and then making the, a tint of it and a shade of it and it becomes very f flat or just not flat but very um, monochromatic which if that's the look you're going for obviously um, it can look really cool but I think sometimes it's okay to just add color for color sake you know if it's the right uh, kind of temperature and value it can work really well in a piece even though it might not be like you know well it's not a shade of red or it doesn't have a little bit of that tint of blue you know you can throw other colors on there um, and it's still gonna um, kind of help with the volume of that shape but you can also just you know make it a little more vibrant a little more interesting so uh, i like that yeah definitely also like if you look if you observe the real world, the, there's colors always like bouncing off each other. Oh my other. gosh. Like, right. There's so many reflective colors yeah. and bounce, bounce light. And yeah, ex things that you would never even imagine. Um, and I yeah, think like once even you start if you're learning... drawing, yeah, no, I was going to say, even if you're drawing like a red apple, it's not like just red. It has so many other little colors in it. Right. And then you put it, you know, if it's sitting on a green table or a yellow table, it's like all of a sudden all of those colors change um, and the way they interact with each other. Yeah, and it's, I think when you start doing photography or painting and you really start to look at color theory, um, those are things that you actively try to look for. Because beforehand, you know, it's a little bit harder to see. Uh, but when you when you start actively looking for it, you're like, oh my gosh, there's, <laughs> there's a, there is no real black. It's got all these other <laughs> colors in it. Yeah, I remember that was kind of like one of the first... Uh lessons that I got in art school that mm -hmm. yeah never use black out of the yeah. two like it's never pure black seems to be a common theme of every every artist I talk to it's like <laughs> somebody told me when I've started oil painting or acrylics <laughs> like don't use black make your yeah. own black we've been all like traumatized into like not using black but <laughs> yeah I think there just is something with, especially with oils and just the, there's something richer about the painting when you don't just use black and you kind of make your own. Yeah, I know I was still like, yeah, no, it sucks out all of the light. It's very flat. So if I am going to use it, I will, like only would use it like for the pupils, like the darkest part of the eye, mm -hmm. because that part, mm -hmm. I guess um doesn't get it absorbs a lot of the light but it's very tiny so it's not noticeable but yeah i know ne i never use black in my illustrations yeah it's i mean for me it's interesting because working on the comic i use a lot of black you know it's, it's basically inking right uh, oh yeah in a digital format so and then on top of that a colorist is coming in and kind of putting his interpretation on top of my black and white drawings. Um, so that's been a kind of interesting process working with another artist um, to kind of create a piece. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a learning curve, definitely. Um, and also just having to use so much black. Like I love line work. Um, so it's not something I'm not used to, but I think really expanding what you can do just with black and white um, before it gets color has been an interesting process. Is it mostly line at work or are you doing black and white, but it's shaded? So it's, it's a lot of line work, but I do a lot of like block in shadows with all black or, you know, with like cross hatching or kind of like, um, strokes that kind of uh kind of um inform the shape that are all next to each other um so there's a bunch of different techniques i've used throughout the comic book but yeah it's it's definitely it's hard because half like at a certain point i was like man i wish i would have you know would have been fun to do this in like pencil or something you know like just a different part about it but 
the the ink is something's really definitive about it and strong and uh i definitely feel like the book itself is kind of a throwback to like 90s comics so it's definitely got that retro vibe to it yeah i'm very curious about the book i'll join yeah. your uh live stream for the book cover yes yes i'll have to uh i'll send you a, a notice When is that one again? Oh gosh, I think <laughs> it's so funny because I can't even remember. I sh I should know. Um, I think it's on <laughs> the twenty fourth or something. I have to look it up. But I should know. Claire's like, "Come on, Chris." <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll find out tomorrow. I'll let you guys know tomorrow. Oh, cool. So now you're using a little bit of a lasso. Yeah, just for the to things that need, yeah, that need like a bit more defined. That was another um, lesson that I learned uh, in school that it was like, I guess my professors were very traditional, but yeah, like shapes are made of like color blocking rather than just like mm -hmm. lines. So right. letting that um, letting that happen. Well, and you have kind of where you have right next to that, where you've got that hard edge, with, especially with fabric. I mean, obviously with the human body as well. You know, parts where there's bone compared to muscle close to the surface, you're going to have a harder edge compared to a softer edge. But with this fabric, right, with those wrinkles, you're going to have where the light wraps over right over that wrinkle. But then when it comes back, sloping on the other side it's going to be a softer uh, gradation and it's kind of amazing those just those little things um how much more they inform the fabric and the material and kind of make it read a little bit better yeah for about light just to make it look like more part of the same unit yeah So if you're ever interested in naming your layers, Robert was telling <laughs> us that you can name the layer under layer settings there, and then that's okay. where you can change the name. Here? Wait. Layer settings, where is that? Is it here? Maybe. <laughs> I'm trying to see. I see layer seems properties. Seems like it would have it right next to the layer. It seems like it would have something. Yeah, huh. I'm not going to do it anyway. <laughs> no, 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 please. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, someone will give us, we'll find out. Yeah, but I, I don't think I'm going to name. Maybe I'll group them. And once I group them, I can do like leg, face. But yeah. Yeah. I like how this is looking. So I now need to kind of like do the same thing for the rest of it. I'm just going to move on to the face because it's looking kind of weird. Um, Looks a bit terrified. <laughs> okay, Robert's referencing the the set. I think the settings cog here on the top right corner there. Maybe that's what he's looking for. Uh, he said top icon on the top. Um. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's there and it's very obvious yeah. and like we'll I am not out. seeing it. Um, that's for day two day two day two i'll come with all my layers we are going names. to <laughs> yeah we're going to force caddy to name her layers just for us it'll take me three hours just to name them <laughs> i want unique like, names for all of them <laughs> yes very special names there's a period when i'm drawing portraits there's a moment in time when they look like really horrible and like creepy because the mm -hmm. eyes are just like stark white and like, but it'll get better. I promise. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the one thing that we're so critical of, uh, as humans. So yeah, there's always the kind of the, 
the process of getting it to feel like it has a soul. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I really admire artists that do like flat work, you know, like flat colors and get it to work and it looks really good. But I feel like I cannot kind of like make myself not add textures and shadows and light. So mm -hmm. because my faces specifically look very weird if I don't. Yeah, so for this is the only thing that I'm going to actually use black, black. Yeah, I so I'm, my wife's gonna have to come into the picture in a second here. I I accidentally parked on the wrong side of the street, <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to avoid a street sweeping ticket. You're okay. You're good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. This hat is so funny. <laughs> it looks like one of those, um, I'm trying to remember what they use it for. I don't know if it's like an egg crate, but it's almost like that styrofoam, like um, crosshatch styrofoam that they put on like fruit or something to like protect it. I don't know if you've ever seen oh, that. Oh yeah. It's like, you know, it kind of stretches. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. It's a very cool design. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thing. yeah, I'm gonna for tomorrow. I'm gonna find this hat and I'm gonna bring it so you can see the text. Yeah, you have to it wear is. it yeah. for the entire stream. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna wear four hats. Just mm -hmm. I do that though. Like I've designed clothes that I have that have ended in like illustrations and paintings. Um, so yeah, that hat will be that for that one. But I have others. Like I designed a pink jumpsuit and that's in one of the paintings. I just. I like putting like little Easter eggs, like, and they're not really Easter eggs because like, I don't think people would recognize them, but it's just like for right. me to enjoy. Yeah. No, it's, it's awesome when you're kind of, your life is informing your art and you can kind of sneak, sneak it in there in your designs. Uh, Becca says that, uh, I think I just found my new favorite fresco brush, soft acrylic. Thanks, Caddy. It's great. <laughs> it's very soft and that one comes with the program correct yeah you don't have to do anything perfect i'm glad um you like it too and i hope people use it i feel like those acrylic brushes it's hard to get them to kind of like feel like actual paint but i think that one does a pretty good job mm-hmm So do you kind of, is there a process for how you go about with the rendering? I see you kind of, you had done a little bit and you're kind of jumping. Is that usually how you do it? You kind of just go from spot to spot where you kind of want to work or do you, do you ever have like, I got to do all of the shading for this now and then I'm going to do the highlights and then I'm going to do. No, I kind of like jump around because I, mm -hmm. I can't get bored. Like it's a lot of this and like doing all of that in one right. go would be a lot. Um, oh, I do see the vermilion. I'm looking at the screen where the screen is, and it looks very different. Um, it looks a little, more, a little bit more red. So right, yeah. Right. 
so I'll have to share this when it's done so you can see how it looks on my screen. Maybe mm -hmm. from Photoshop it'll look different, but yeah. But yeah, I jump around. Um, also because like I feel like when you look at something for too long, you can like stop seeing things. Like for example, I did the hat and then I didn't look at it again. And now I'm going back back at it and realizing like, oh, some of these were not wrapped around. So it's right. like a nice break from whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I, I'm very similar where I kind of try to stay as interested as possible in what I'm doing so that I don't get lazy with my lines or my rendering. But I also to try to create some kind of structure for myself so I don't get carried away in any <laughs> part of my where it's like, hmm, I don't know if I'm going to be able to apply that much detail to the rest of my painting. So it's like I try to prevent myself from going finishing too much before I kind of touch other other places of my painting. I feel like that's very wise to do because it has happened to me with working with editorial that I make something super detailed and then I have to kind of like brush the rest pull a little it, bit more. Pull it back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, have you seen that meme of like the horse that is like half half of the horse is like completely rendered like super realistically and the other half of the horse is just, just like, like a stick <laughs> figure yeah, yeah. <laughs> i feel like i now i am fully committed of making everything just like this little leg so i have to mm -hmm. finish it like i cannot just have yeah. like this little this three being like rendered and the rest are like flat right no and that's i think sometimes <laughs> i do that as well to kind of give myself a reference point of like okay where am I going to take this painting or how far am I going to take it? And it's almost like doing a, like a test part, right? Like, okay, this is the level of finish that I want for the rest of the painting. Yeah. Uh, and like, this is a one off piece. So I think it's fine. I'll, I'll make it. If this was a graphic novel, like you, like you're working on it, it would be impossible. Like to everything like that. Yeah. Eva says she can't wait to see everything like that little leg. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, yeah. I know, for example, those little like ear moths, they're going to take a while because they're kind of like furry. So. And you want to create those textures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen's asking uh, if you have an agent or you're a freelancer. And I think we answered that earlier. You you represent I, yourself, correct? Like, well, yeah, when I, I don't have an agent for illustration, I like all the illustration work, the freelance illustration work that I get. Um, I get it through myself because sometimes agents uh, just take like a big cut. I do have a full time job as a as an art director at the Washington Post. I used to freelance before oh, okay. with them and now um, now I work with them. And so, of course, I'm taking less freelance, uh, but um, I've talked with agents still because, you know, I still get to do that but i just feel like unless it's someone that you're really sure you want to work with um agents agents can definitely help you and like they'll help you like uh negotiating prices and stuff but they also take a commission so i feel like you have to weigh in what you want if you're already getting work then maybe you don't need them um mm -hmm. as much i would say like anyone who's considering working with an agent really needs to take into account like all their um they're kind of like rules because there are some that will take a commission even if the client didn't find you through them, which I think it's yeah. pretty, pretty standard, but it also feels like, well, if they're finding you because of you, then yeah, why are you, yeah. <laughs> why are you getting some of that commission? That wasn't really, you didn't do anything for that. Exactly. Yeah. I so. had, uh, listened in on, uh, the, there's these two animator twins called the Bancroft, Bancroft brothers. Um, and they kind of became well known because of their work with Disney. Um, but they had talked about agents uh, in the animation industry. And, and it was a similar thing where it's like, you probably don't need one for the most part, unless you're doing, for them it was, you're doing big work. Like, and you might need especially cause it's film and you just, you might need an agent to help you negotiate kind of these larger scale prices for these big projects that might be really difficult to kind of do on your own. 
but it was a similar consensus of like if it's for smaller work or things where you you're able to access those clients already, then it's not really necessary. But it could be uh, if you can financially deal with it, it is could be an advantage as far as getting those clients in the first place. Yeah, I think the other part of it is how comfortable are you with like the business part of it? Because right. I, I am pretty comfortable like sending invoices and like sending emails and like being on top of it. I know there are some artists that are very much like just want to focus on their art and not do any of that. So if you want any someone to handle like sending invoices, like following up for payment, then maybe an agent is like a good idea for you. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of time, especially freelance, a lot of time emailing, <laughs> video calls, <laughs> contract work. Yeah, just it's you got to do a lot of a lot of administrative work for yourself, which is not always very fun. Yeah, I feel like people don't talk about it a lot and then it's like a surprise because who wants to <laughs> <laughs> i know i know taxes and like all that oh, stuff is horrible uh, yeah taxes are, that's that's a long long painful story for freelancers <laughs> it's like my least favorite time of the year uh mm -hmm. i get so stressed out especially in america i don't know if, i feel like american taxes are just a headache for the most yeah part. and i also feel like what if something gets done bad like on accident but like you end up going to jail i don't know i feel like i am always very scared yeah, so the, it's like <laughs> yeah and are do you have uh do you have dual citizenship or are you here yeah. on visa or, okay um i have dual citizenship uh so both colombian and american and then and as far as the freelance work or the things so you answer this or not but do you do you have to pay taxes in both countries or is it um, only the US because I think you can I mean I haven't lived in Colombia for so long uh -huh. and I'm already paying I actually <laughs> I don't think I have to like pay Colombia I know I know I do pay a lot of taxes here in the US like for mm -hmm. when you're freelancing it's kind of like you you have to put aside at like around like 30% of what you're paid just yeah. because if you don't do that, then at the end of the year, you're going to get like those hefty yeah, it's, bills. <laughs> it's like basically at least 20%, uh, but right, like if not more. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of fees and like having your own business and self-employment fees. It's, it's just, it's it seems kind of ridiculous at some points. You're like, what? It's like you guys don't want me to work for myself. <laughs> I know. I mean, like when you're employed, your employer kind of like takes those taxes every month. And so right. you, don't, and it, you don't have to worry about it that much because it's already exactly. being taken out. Exactly. I know yeah, for it's like first you time. You kind of have to yeah. do it for yourself and kind of remind yourself like that's not really what you're taking home. You, you've got to make sure that you set that aside somewhere. Yeah, don't spend or, it or, because if not, geez. Yeah, pay pay quarterly as well. Is a, that's a great way to kind of mitigate the giant uh tax <laughs> tax number at the end of the year that you're gonna owe um if you try to pay quarterly or just estimate it quarterly that can help out a lot because even yeah. if you overpay you'll get it as a refund and if you underpay at least you've been paying it the whole year so it's not so uh it's not such a big Painful. number at the end of the year yeah yeah i think it's just a shock when you hear those yeah. numbers and you're like oh that what? first time you're just like <laughs> oh excuse me how much do i have yeah i know it's yeah it's not great i didn't go to school for illustration i went for for like studio art uh and then mm -hmm. for graphic design for my masters but like neither of those times anyone told me anything about that like taxes which is how you survive like yeah i mean the making the art is great but if you don't have any grasp on the the financial and the business part of it it's like you will not thrive as an artist you know it's it's a very important aspect i mean i really think all schools should have really like big time business classes that really tell you how to be a freelance artist or how to you know operate in in the world like that because it's just it's such a huge part of it yeah i wonder if that's different now though like did you ever get a class like that when when you did illustration no, <laughs> no I, I mean i think you know it was something discussed with uh 
teachers and, and other other students or, or you know mentors and people but I didn't have any like formal training I took you know some business classes when I was at community college but that's about it I wonder if we have any students in the chat if they know if they are they get those classes or, or if still like a mystery for people yeah chat if any one of you have uh, been to art school or any type of um, visual arts was there ever any type of business classes uh, as part of your curriculum kind of interested to know and also it is 11 15 which means we're going to start wrapping things up in about five minutes so uh caddy please just uh just so you know find find a, a stopping point in the next five minutes and Perfect. excited to get rolling on this tomorrow already i'm like ooh, it's starting i'm just starting to see it <laughs> it takes a bit but it's gonna get there um yeah no we're excited yeah. um i mean i can stop anytime oh no and... please keep keep going because you have time so okay, uh, don't cool. stop yet i'll let you know i'm just i'm just kind of giving you a, a warning perfect I it's think a good warning the phase will take a bit um a lot of work, but yeah, I'm glad I changed at least the structure. I think the other phase was a little different. Yeah, that's there's nothing worse than trying to uh, render a wonky face <laughs> and just, just be like, why isn't this working? Uh, Alessandra says, I wish I got a class like that when I was in art school. <laughs> yes, I think this yeah. is something that uh, many people I've talked to feel the same way. I hope schools change that, um, especially because a lot of art students are going to go into freelance rather than like being employment employed with yeah. the company. Yeah, I think just the way the the business is going and the world is going is, yeah, you end up you end up doing a lot of freelance, not even realizing it. Even if you're working for big companies, um, you might you might be working with them uh, contract based and not as a, an employee. So. Um, yeah, the, the more you know uh, about it, the better. Obviously not very fun to talk about when you're a young budding artist, <laughs> excited to yeah. enter the industry. And, you know, it's like, well, have you looked at what the taxes are going to look like? And <laughs> it's like, I'm not thinking about that, man. Maybe that's why they don't teach it. Maybe the school's tried and no one took the class. <laughs> We, we did provide it and you know, <laughs> no one took it. Yeah. Yeah, like I can see all of those colors being implemented even into the face. All of the, you know, just taking a little bit here and there, even though that base color is different, you're still adding some of those highlights and those shadows from yeah. the material of the cloth and the background. Yeah, it's just so fun to like make something out of nothing. So mm -hmm. I feel like that's why I like adding so much detail, trying to make something kind of like somewhat real. Um, And do you always, I mean, you always do pretty decent rendering on the faces, I feel like, in your illustrations. I feel like your faces have a, usually have a prominent place. Even if, even I know in this one, it's a small part of the composition. It still, I think, is going to kind of demand some type of attention, correct? Yeah, I think it's not so much intentional. It's just like, I like painting faces uh, mm -hmm. and I do love, like, I think drawing humans it's like my favorite thing. So um, right. I think I just enjoy it. And so I tend to spend time on it regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're good at it. So I think it's people like looking at it. Thank you. She's looking a little greasy. <laughs> I think too much, <laughs> too, too many highlights, <laughs> but. 
Maybe, maybe too many clothes. <laughs> maybe we take off all oh, true. Babies. Just beating yeah. sweat. They're like, okay, this is too hot. It's too hot. <laughs> I also like the stage when it's like some things are kind of like rendered and then others are so flat. It looks mm -hmm. so out of place, but it, it also kind of like show, hints at the process too. Yeah, it could be a cool, cool style choice. I always like that with kind of like really flat, flat shapes or graphic elements with really polished rendered elements, kind of the contrast and the push and pull. All right, well, it is 1120. And if you're joining us, it's we're getting really close to the end of the stream here, but we are with Caddy Huertas. She is an editorial illustrator in Washington, D.C. Um, we've been doing this really, really fun illustration for the coming of winter because summer is ending or it has already ended. I don't even know. It might have already ended. We might be in fall already, people. <laughs> um, but loving this. This is just day one. So tomorrow we will be back 930 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. For day two, uh, Caddy, do you just want to really quickly uh, go over what we did today and what we'll be doing tomorrow? Sure. So I came with some rejected sketches from previous assignments and picked one and decided to kind of like start working on it. So I first uh, came up with a color palette, which is based on colors that I tend to use pretty regularly in my work. And that's the little uh, swatch here at the bottom and we filled in all the shapes with flat colors using more of an inking brush and that took a little bit of time and then once we had that um, i started rendering uh, using like more painterly brushes and using clipping masks and so the idea is that tomorrow we're going to finish the illustration here um, have it all kind of like at a very render level and then move on to photoshop to finish it up um, add textures, correct colors, and that kind of stuff. Awesome. Yeah, so please, if, if you joined today, awesome. Thank you so much for joining. But also come by tomorrow so you can see this finished. And like you said, hopefully we can get, maybe we'll even get some motion, some animation at the end. Who knows? Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's so great having you for this day one. Uh, I always enjoy seeing new artists work, especially artists that I haven't been introduced to already. So beautiful work today. Um, also, uh, we'll be back tomorrow, like I said, 9.30 a.m. Pacific for part two. Join us as uh, she adds the details, creates the adjustments in Photoshop, and then we'll also go over exporting for digital and print. Um, also stick around for a packaging design bootcamp with Nick Longo, followed by mobile app design live stream with Taria Tolbert on Adobe Live as she creates a travel mobile app using Adobe XD. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming by. We really enjoyed our time today, and we are looking forward to a really fun stream tomorrow. So thank you, everybody, and thank you, Caddy. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye thank everyone. you for having me.